Hello and welcome to Getaway Day. My name is Gautam Rao. If you're watching on Twitch, you can see that my co-host Mason is not with us today. Do not fret. Mason is okay. He is just out of town uh, on a work trip. So I am flying solo today. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, this will be my first time for running the pod solo. I do have uh, hopefully a good show in store for you guys. Um, if you enjoy our podcast, please subscribe on Spotify, uh, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get podcasts. We are there every week. Um, this week, no different. And um, today's episode, we're going to be talking about some pleasant surprises in the early goings of this season. And uh, also kind of going to talk about a number of different transactions that have taken place across the league as the rosters have shrunk down to 26 from 28 for the first month of the season. Um, a number of different ramifications of that shift in the MLB landscape. Um, a programming note before we get started, next week we are off uh, doing a typical podcast. And the reason is because we are going on a big baseball trip with we being Mason, Matthew, our occasional co-host, and me. We've kind of danced around the subject a little bit, but we haven't really gotten into the details. I thought maybe I could take a couple minutes here to talk about where we're going to be and what we're going to do. So this baseball trip is a West Coast swing starting in Arizona. That's kind of the business aspect of the trip. We, we need to knock off Chase Field. That's not exactly high on our priority list, but we're baseball fans. We got to go everywhere. After Arizona, we're going to head to San Diego and then follow it up and finish up in Los Angeles. Over the course of the trip, we're going to take in six baseball games, uh, see nine teams total. And today I was kind of mapping out some of the starting pitchers projected to start over the course of, of these games. We are just so excited to be going on this trip. And, you know, it's, it's a long time coming. This trip was scheduled for 2020. And then the pandemic uh, stopped the world about three weeks before we were supposed to go on this trip or, or a month or something like that. I mean, we we're geared up, ready to go. 2021, it didn't really come together. 2022, we're finally making it happen. So some of the pitchers we're going to see, Trevor Rogers, Joe Musgrove, Kyle Hendricks, Mike Clevenger recently uh, activated from the IL today on Wednesday. Um, Josh Fleming, Shohei Otani is scheduled to start next Wednesday at Angel Stadium. Uh, that is going to be amazing to take in live. And then we follow that up with Clayton Kershaw himself, the GOAT, live at um, Dodger Stadium against the Phillies. That is, honestly, that's a dream come true to see Kershaw pitch live at his home ballpark. I could not be more excited. And um, yeah, we're just we're just so lucky that we're able to, to make this happen. And we're going to be hopefully giving you some uh, some insight from the ballparks that we're at over the course of the week and um, just kind of give you some short form video type podcasts as we uh, make the expedition through the West Coast there uh, of baseball ball ballpark. So really looking forward to that. Um, so no podcast next week. That's the that's the big takeaway, I guess. And I'm sure we'll have some good stories as we return uh, two weeks from today on May 18th. So let's start off with the Mets, who had another fantastic week. They've won every series they played this season, and then they did something very cool this week, and that was throw a no-hitter. And I know what you're saying, another combined no-hitter. Yep, it was. But the more I think about combined no-hitters, the more I kind of come to appreciate them as team accomplishments. And this one specifically, kind of like the Cubs uh, combined no-hitter last year against the Dodgers, 
three of the relievers who pitched in this game after Tyler McGill had no idea a no-hitter was happening. Those pitchers were Drew Smith, uh, Joely Rodriguez, Seth Lugo, and then Edwin Diaz finished it off with just a incredible ninth inning. His slider was was dancing like way out of the strike zone. People were, uh, you know, whiffing, looking really bad. And after the game, they asked him about it, and he was like, "Yeah, my slider was nasty tonight." So when Edwin Diaz himself is saying that about his own pitches, you know he's locked in. The starter of the game for the Mets was Tyler McGill, a guy that I've been very interested in um, seeing how you do after an interesting rookie season last year. He pitched five innings in this game with three walks, five strikeouts. He's been fantastic this season. Um, Maybe you can attribute some of that to the ball. Uh, He actually started off today's game against Atlanta with four more no-hit innings. So he actually kind of got his own no-hitter over two consecutive starts. Um, this season overall, he, he did uh, fall apart a little bit in the, in, the, in the ball game after the fourth inning today. But the overall numbers are, are sterling. 243 ERA and 33 in a third innings pitch. 0.90 whip. Um, 36 strikeouts and just eight walks. So his command was kind of off in the no hitter game. And I was watching it live. It didn't even seem, it didn't feel like a no hitter. He had the three walks in there and uh, the ballpark maybe didn't even realize it until seventh, eighth inning, even though they usually figure those things out pretty quick. Uh, Tyler McGill, he's, he's really fascinating to me. Uh, Really kind of an imposing figure on the mound He's six foot seven, um, 230 pounds. So get that, uh, uh, that angle, that downward angle of his pitches. It's like kind of scary to see that guy. Um, the Mets are rolling right now. And it's kind of funny that people are probably going to be trying to attribute that to Buck Showalter. And I mean, I am always skeptical about what the real impact of a manager is, but I will say this about Buck. From everything I've read about the guy, everything I've heard about him, no one is more prepared in the business uh, as a manager. And people talk about him being an old school guy, just kind of uh, going old, old school methods and everything. But I don't actually think that's true. I think he's a guy that is very willing to use the information at his disposal and he works at it really hard. Like he, he, if he doesn't know analytics, maybe he didn't have that accessible to him in Baltimore because they didn't really have that department even slightly. But now that he's with New York forward thinking organization and he's going to take in all the information and use it to um, the team's advantage. And he's kind of just a steadying hand for the club and you know, it's, it's working out great. Robinson Cano uh, was designated for assignment. So he was kind of the biggest name guy who uh, was designated for assignment uh, when the rosters shrunk down from 28 men to 26 on Monday. Um, There is a limit actually for the number of pitchers a roster can carry right now. Uh, Well, right now that limit is 14 pitchers which will shrink down to 13 on May 29th. This rule actually was initially supposed to go into effect in 2020. And, you know, pandemic season happened 2021. There was kind of the, the quick ramp up. Um, so they, they said, no, no, we can't do this right now. 2022 happened. Uh, lockout shortened spring training saying, no, we can't do this. This is dangerous to the pitchers. We need more pitchers on the roster. Teams are carrying 16 pitchers, 15 pitchers. um, And now we're finally going to get to the point on May 29th where there is a limit to the number of pitchers, and that will be 13. So last week we talked a lot about the different impacts to um, 
offense and, and how offense is really down this year. And that's based on the pitchers. And having one less man in your bullpen could actually be something that could help offense um, as things heat up, as, um, you know, starters are kind of wearing down as the season goes along. One one less man in the bullpen is actually a bigger deal than it it appears at first. I think uh, with this Cano decision, though, they, um, I mean, it honestly was not a difficult decision for them. He's really struggled this year. Um, not that he's played that much, but they they were not wanting to send a Dom Smith or a J.D. Davis down to the minor leagues, even though those guys had options. Those guys were contributing to the ball club a lot more than Cano was. And a lot of people are giving credit to Steve Cohen for, you know, authorizing this decision to release a guy that they owe oh just 37 and a half million dollars over the next two years so he 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 did in my opinion he did what needs to be done it's a it's a simple business decision this guy's not helping you might as well just pay to get rid of him and it's a sunk cost anyways i mean He's not even a guy that was signed by Cohen. He has no ties to this man. Like that was another man, him, Brody Van Wagenen. And actually, I want to talk about that trade because it it's a very fascinating trade. It's been talked about for years since it happened in December 2018. Here here's the here's the game. It's one of my favorites. Revisit an old trade and see what we think about it a few years later when we can actually make probably a better judgment on on the whole situation. So the trade in December 2018, Robinson Cano and Edwin Diaz for Jay Bruce, Anthony Swarzak, right-handed pitcher Gerson Bautista, Jared Kelnick, and Justin Dunn, all going to the Seattle Mariners. After this trade happened, Jared Kelnick was kind of the biggest name in this trade, huge prospect. Everyone was dunking on the Mets saying, how could they make this trade? You're giving up a top five hitting prospect with years of team control, and you're getting these washed up uh, Robinson Cano and uh, Edwin Diaz. So it was almost universal hatred of this trade for the Mets side, and everyone loved it for the Mariners. So if we just take a look at what the guys did that Seattle actually um, – received because they they got a lot of parts jay bruce he just played 47 games before he actually got flipped that uh 2019 season anthony swarzak also got traded mid-season that year after he only pitched in about 15 games with seattle gerson bautista pretty much had no impact at the major league level he's not even in affiliated ball today he's pitching in the mexican league justin dunn was somewhat successful but he had trouble staying on the field and he never made more than 11 starts, which uh, he did last year. He had a 394 ERA over 25 games. And he was actually part of the big Jesse Winker, Eugenio Suarez trade this past off season. And now he's injured on the Reds. Jared Kelnick though, he's the guy, I mean, you got to be concerned about <laughs> what he's produced at the major league level to this point. He's only 22 years old, but in 115 games with the Mariners, he's got a 173, 255, 339 triple slash. That is not good. He's got 16 homers this year. It's not been any better. Just two homers, 134, 203, 284. That's a 48 WRC plus. More than 50% worse than an average player. This is, by WRC+, plus, he's been worse than he was last year as a rookie. He's still striking out 40.5%, which is in the worst three in the league, up there with Joey Gallo and uh, Miguel Sano. So, like, if, if you're going to strike out that much, you got hit for a lot more power or walk a lot more. He's only walking at an 8% clip. That's... Simply not enough. And we're getting to the point where 
he could be uh, sent down again. Kyle Lewis is in a uh, rehab stint right now, and he's the logical replacement for him in that, in that outfield for the Mariners. On the Mets side, though, of this trade, Cano kind of really wasn't that good. He missed a year with the suspension, that second PED suspension of his career that's really going to taint his long-term kind of um, legacy and probably kill his uh, Hall of Fame chances. Edwin Diaz has been the best player in this deal by far. He's pitched 156 innings, 386 ERA, ridiculous strikeout numbers every year, and he's kind of just, for the most part, other than some kind of high-profile blow-ups over the years, he's been a very solid contributor to that bullpen. And he's a guy, you, you kind of trust him to to do the job of the ninth inning. And he's been pretty dang good this year. So from the perspective of the Mets, they essentially paid a whole bunch of money and gave up a bunch of spare parts and a guy who was the, supposed to be the surefire uh, prospect who was no chance, too big to fail. Like this guy's going to be a superstar right away. And that has not been the case with Kelnick. And and they got the this uh, closer who is uh, – top of the line like elite closer and and he's a guy that's just 28 and he's a, he's going to be a free agent this this upcoming winter and he's a guy that the Mets would certainly have interest in bringing back and how many times can you say that about uh, a guy you trade for you not you not always are the teams as interested as the players in in making that um next free agent contract come together. So I I think that the Mets would definitely want to re-sign this guy long-term and he's still super young. Kind of switching gears here to the Mariners side. Uh, Mitch Handiger, the guy can't catch a break. He was on the COVID IL first day back. He sprains his ankle and it's a grade two high ankle sprain. That's going to put him out six to eight weeks. When the guy plays, as he showed last year when he was fully healthy for the first time in a long time, he's a great player, and he's the best player that the Mariners kind of have in, in that lineup. So losing him for six to eight weeks is a big blow. J.P. Crawford is the first guy, other than McGill, that I want to talk about as being one of the surprises of this year. Crawford's only 27, but he was another guy like Kelnick, who was a first-round pick, 13th overall in 2013 by the Phillies. Um, he was supposed to be a big deal and he's never really hit super well. And he really kind of lacks power, plays great shortstop defense. And I'll be honest, I was one of the people kind of questioning the Mariners decision, Jerry DePoto, to not pursue uh, one of the really good shortstops on this, this past off season's uh, free agent class. Because I kind of saw J.P. Crawford as being a weak link in in the lineup for Seattle, but J.P. Crawford has has proven me wrong in a big way. He's hitting 375, 469, 625. The guy has never slugged above 400 in a single season, and he's slugging 625. He's got four homers. Uh, last year he hit 12 barrels. This year he's already got four. And Put a cherry on the top of that. He's he's striking out less than he ever has at a truly elite 10.4% clip. And he's walking more than he's ever done at 12.5%. He's never really been a hard, like he doesn't hit the ball hard and that's still kind of the case. But the fact that he's making so much contact and he's making more hard contact than he has in the past, like that becomes a very valuable player to the Mariners, especially when you factor in the excellent defense that he provides at shortstop for this team. Uh, Logan Gilbert, um, kind of dominating so far this season. He changed the shape of his slider this offseason. So that was kind of a logical breakout candidate. Not all these are uh, pleasant surprises. They're more like breakouts, you could call some of them. 
Another uh, couple milestones here. Clayton Kershaw is now the Dodgers all-time strikeout king, passing Don Sutton, uh, who had 2,696 strikeouts in his Dodgers career, which is just that is just a bit, that is a lot of strikeouts. And Kershaw got this uh, accomplishment on Saturday night. Um, Dodger Stadium went crazy, massive ovation for him as as expected and deserved. Hey, Kershaw kind of just wanted to get the ball back and and start pitching again. Then he kind of acknowledged the crowd and um, he he took in that moment and it it's another just another milestone for a legend and uh, future Hall of Famer. Dusty Baker also reached the 2000 win uh, plateau as a manager, which is kind of a big deal because uh, he's the first black manager to ever reach 2000 wins. And there's only been 13 managers in history uh, total to reach that uh, mark. The Royals got some bad news last week when Adalberto Mondesi was diagnosed with a torn ACL. Mondesi has not hit at the major league level. He was a tantalizing prospect as well. This year, no better. 140, 204, 140, so no slug whatsoever. Uh, this guy just had no discipline, and it's al- almost like uh, the Royals got to move on at this point. It's, it's, uh, he just hasn't shown enough development Striking out more than ever, 280 career on base percentage. I mean, come on. What does this mean for the Royals? So in the in the near term, Nicky Lopez is going to uh, slot over at shortstop, moving from second base. Whit Merrifield's going to move in from right field to second base. And this opens up some playing time for uh, Edward Olivares and Kyle Isbell, who are both young, kind of unproven players. Olivares is a guy who we talked about before. He's kind of been shuttled up and down from Omaha. I mean, how many times can a guy drive back and forth between Kansas City and Omaha? That that must be brutal. God. Uh, he had a great game yesterday, batting leadoff for the Royals, where he had uh, four for five with a couple doubles. So he's an intriguing prospect, as is Isbell. Third base is still Bobby Witt, and I'm kind of wondering why the Royals don't just make Bobby Witt the shortstop at this point. Nicky Lopez is a nice player, but why not have your franchise player just play the position that makes him the most valuable player and a potential MVP candidate down the line? Bobby Witt started slow this year. He did homer for his first uh, big league homer yesterday. And uh, seems like he's turning a corner. I'm, I'm glad they're sticking with him and, and didn't send him quickly back to the AAA level. I mean, what can he really learn there? Like, he's dominated it. He needs the reps. And I'd, lo- I'd love to see him play shortstop, honestly. MJ Melendez was also recalled when Cam Gallagher, the backup catcher, uh, went on the IL. Melendez, ridiculous numbers at AAA and AA last year. 41 total homers so I'd like to see what he can do Um, a team that's also struggling kind of like the Royals but was supposed to be quite a bit better are the Atlanta Braves they did get Ronald Acuna back last Thursday Uh, there was a kind of uh, fun story where uh, Alex Anthopoulos the general manager of the Braves FaceTime Acuna at 1 a.m. while Acuna was playing Call of Duty to tell him he was going to be playing that night in Atlanta. Acuna apparently started uh, uh, screaming and uh, celebrating. So, I mean, can you blame him? Would you rather play in Gwinnett or for the Atlanta Braves in a big league game? I mean, he's got to be itching to go, and he showed it in his first game back with two stolen bases. And they asked him... You know, what he thinks about his game, how it's changed since the injury. And he said that his speed may have actually improved. And that's a scary thought for Ronald Acuna to be saying that his speed's actually better because he worked on his uh, strengthening of his leg muscles during that rehab process for the ACL. I mean, 
that's going to be fun to watch. And you know the Braves are going to turn it around. They're just 11 and 15 at this point. But, I mean, the, the team's too talented for them not to be making some noise in that National League East. One guy who is keeping them afloat is Kyle Wright. Kyle Wright was the fifth overall pick in 2017 by the Braves. He made it to the majors very early, um, kind of in in his development. He never really dominated any level of the minors, but you know he passed through and he really wasn't good at any point in the in the major leagues until this year when he's throwing as hard as he, he's he's throwing harder than he's ever thrown his fastball velocity is up to 95.4 miles per hour throwing less sliders uh more curveballs and changeups he's got a 174 ERA 30% strikeout rate just 5.8% walks it's a story in um development and that development for these top prospects that are supposed to make an impact from day one, it doesn't always work like that. Prospect development, not linear. Um, Wright's 26, 27 years old. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer for for a um, pitcher, especially. And they, they tossed him in some tough situations, pitching postseason games. He actually had a really good uh, game in the World Series last year, so maybe that was... Uh, that should have been a sign of things to come. Like this one's really not that surprising because he is that top prospect. This is what he was supposed to do. He's just finally realizing it at this point. So that that's a very uh, pleasant supl- surprise for this 2022 season to this point. Um, a hot team right now are the uh, Los Angeles Angels. And I I was kind of uh, stalling there because I, I don't remember the last time I've said that the Angels are, are hot. They're 15 and 10. They're in first place in the West. And the conversation with the Angels always got to start with Mike Trout. And what is Mike Trout doing? He is doing Mike Trout things. And he's kind of reclaimed or reclaimed is not the right word for it. It's just reaffirmed his throne as the best player in the league. He's right up there with the the war leaders. He's already accumulated 1.6 F4, uh, fourth in the major leagues to this point. I mean, is Mike Trout getting better? Guys hitting 319, 449, 694, striking out less than he has in years. And, you know being an impact player in center field as well. I mean, there was talk about Brandon Marsh taking over there. Uh, Trout said, no, no, man, like I can handle center field and he's showing that. So, I mean, you got, you, you love to see it. The supporting cast around Trout though is the real story. And uh, we got to talk about Taylor Ward, who is just coming off probably the greatest baseball week of his entire life including the minor leagues, including, you know, college, maybe even better than any week he had in Little League. Like, last week, Taylor Ward, 13 hits, 10 runs, 4 homers, 13 RBI, 448 batting average. Overall, these numbers are a little bit outdated. He he went over 4 yesterday, but before yesterday, 390, 493, 746, five homers, 16 runs in 16 games. You really can't <laughs> do much better than that to start the year. And with Ward, he's uh he's another former first round pick who's now 28. He's been kind of an up and down guy for the Angels. Never really panned out, never really had a position, uh kind of dabbled as a catcher, as a third baseman, really wasn't that great at it. Now they've got him fixed at right field. Um and I read a great article in The Athletic by uh, Sam Blum, uh, who covers the Angels. I definitely checked that article out. And it, it was kind of talking about the changes that Taylor Ward's made to his um, mental approach at the plate. And he mentioned something that I'd really never heard of. And that was kind of uh, just blocking out the count completely. So he just goes up to the plate 
and he's trying not to think about the count. He just makes it as um, as simple as possible. Just wants to um, see the ball, hit the ball. Sometimes baseball is as simple as that. Taylor Ward's probably not going to put up Mike Trout level production, but if he's a starting, you know, above average player, which he actually was when he played last year with Angels, he was a 111 WRC plus in uh, limited time. Then you're talking about a pretty solid outfield because Brandon Marsh is also hitting. The downside of the situation is that Joe Adele was sent down to the minors yesterday, and and that's that's brutal because. You can't even blame the Angels this time for not playing him because when the other three outfielders are playing, all Marsh or all Adele was doing was platooning with Marsh, and uh, with Marsh as the left-handed batter, he gets the large side of that platoon. So you know Adele really wasn't playing too much, so he he's got to get those reps. Otherwise, he's never going to develop. He's still striking out a ton. I hope he gets it together, but. Um, on a contending team, I mean, if if he's the kind of odd man out, so be it. The Angels got kind of uh, other things they gotta they gotta worry about. Another team that could definitely afford to uh, have some more of these uh, top prospect type guys we haven't really seen much over the years. Uh, that's the Orioles, and the Orioles just. Wow, I I, did, I don't even know what to say. Like they've actually been solid pitching wise, which has been surprising. Their ballpark is playing incredibly small. I think there's it's the worst park for homers, worst park for runs scored, which is a complete 180 from where it was uh, in prior years, where that was, that place you know the ball is just flying out of Camden Yards. Now you can barely hit a homer because they've extended that left field wall and raised the height of the wall. So pretty much impossible now to hit a home run to left field at um at Oriole or uh, Camden Yard. So it's it's uh you almost wonder if it's like an overcorrection kind of thing, but what can they do about it now? I don't think they're gonna dig up that wall and rebuild it again. The Orioles did bring up one of their pitching prospects, Kyle Bradish, I believe his name is pronounced. He pitched six innings with two earned runs in his major league debut. He was part of the Dylan Bundy trade. And he was dominating AAA, so deserved call up. We're all just waiting for uh, Adley Rutschman and Grayson Rodriguez, who clearly, um, like, I want to see this guy. He's only pitched 21 and two-thirds innings at uh, AAA. Results not so great, uh, 415 ERA, but he has struck out 33. What's the challenge here for Grayson Rodriguez? Just let him develop at the major league level. There's no – I mean, it's probably just a service time manipulation thing. They're probably not going to be competitive for years to come, but I guess I'm just acting like an impatient Orioles fan, which is – understandable i mean well they've been terrible for five years now and they look like they're going to be terrible for the next five and they're not even playing players who are you know young and trying to prove themselves they're they're kind of playing these middle-aged players that are in their primes right now but they're not star level players when you look at their their roster here like just you got you got Mullins, Mancini, Santander. These guys are their entire lineup is guys that are over twenty five. They don't even have a guy on their roster other than Tyler Nevin, Nevin who's almost twenty five and he's barely a prospect. How can you have a rebuilding team that's not young at all? It just doesn't make any sense. You gotta you gotta cycle through these guys, turn through these guys, and see what sticks. They kind of did that in the case of of some of these guys, like um, like Mullins, and that was a great find. But is he going to be on the the next good Orioles team or next playoff team? I highly doubt it. If they don't trade him before he reaches free agency. Okay, enough gloom and doom on the um, Orioles. 
moving over to the Twins, who have uh, been impressive, especially on the pitching side. And um, Bailey Ober, unfortunately, was placed on the IL with a groin strain. But before that, he had a 275 ERA, 16 strikeouts, and 19 and two-thirds innings. Sonny Gray, on the other hand, is in the middle of his rehab assignment after he was down with his own, I think, groin strain. Uh, those <laughs> those seem to be going around right now, but he should be back shortly. Joe Ryan's the guy I wanted to talk about here. And I kind of wanted to introduce a new term, something that I've been looking into and seems really applicable to Joe Ryan. Because I, I tried to talk about Joe Ryan and kind of explain what makes him good and what made him good in, in the minor leagues. And I kind of struggled in the past to do that. He doesn't have premium velocity. He doesn't have amazing spin rate. He throws maybe 93 at the max. And he threw a lot of fastballs in the past. And it's kind of like, how is this guy succeeding? He strikes out a ton of batters and he doesn't really walk, walk anyone. And the answer is deception. If I can explain the way this guy pitches, he kind of, uh, he's got a low arm slot, but it's not really sidearm. It's, it's over the top, but it's very low. So kind of think Max Scherzer. He also hides the ball extremely well behind his back. Then uh, he kind of leads with his elbow, and then the ball just sort of pops out like that, and um, it's uh, it's one of those things you just kind of tune into a Joe Ryan start when you get the chance, and you can understand why this is. Uh, it looks a little bit unorthodox, I guess. It looks good and everything. Like there's nothing wrong with it, but it's it's different than a lot of guys you'll see. The statistic here that I wanted to introduce is something called vertical approach angle. So vertical approach angle, it's, it's, it sounds complicated. It's very simple. It's just the angle that the baseball crosses home plate with, uh, you know, as it, as it passes through the strike zone, what's the angle? Just like we have launch angle for batted balls, what's the angle that it comes off the bat? This is for pitchers. And the idea behind vertical long, um, approach angle is that a flatter pitch is going to be more successful and get more swinging strikes. And that's kind of borne out in the data. We've seen more um, swinging strikes on fastballs that have a flatter um, vertical approach angle. And by flatter, I mean closer to zero degrees. So for a little bit more info on this, so a zero degree pitch off the mound is never going to be a strike. It's always going to be way above the strike zone because because the pitcher's on the mound, it's raised. If it's going zero degrees when it crosses the plate, it's way high. So there's got to be some negative angle. But if it's as close to zero as possible as Joe Ryan has, he's he's got one of the flattest fastballs in the league. So it's passing through that zone. Uh, kind of near negative four degrees and and that what that does is it doesn't allow the the batter's bat path to kind of lend itself directly into that ball and um that's what's working for joe ryan to this point i don't know if it's something that um is going to keep up the more teams start to figure out his uh weird delivery and uh release point kind of thing but the ver vertical approach angle is something that I've been looking into recently it's very uh intriguing to me and he's a guy that's actually compared similarly to Jacob deGrom who is another guy with a very flat uh, not steep fastball but the thing with Jacob deGrom that makes him so good is that his fastball is 99 and Joe Ryan's is 91 so yeah, just, just something to keep in mind there. Uh, Chris Paddock is also seemingly rounding into form. The Twins fixed him already. He's got a 315 ERA in 20 innings. He has not given up a home run this year. That was a major problem with the Padres. And they have him throwing his fastball less, uh, which I think is, is going to end up being a really good thing because that changeup was always the elite pitch. He's throwing the curveball now, too. Um, moving along... Uh, we're, we're kind of going disaster to uh, 
like non disaster back to disaster and and that's the Cincinnati Reds who may not have won a game since the last time we talked, or maybe they've only won one. The three and twenty. This is the worst start by any baseball team in about a hundred years. It's actually shocking how bad this team is. And it mostly starts from some of their injuries and uh just a lack of pitching depth in general. Luis Castillo being out, that that hurts a lot. And Tyler Malley has not been the same. Hunter Green, Nicola Dolo, I mean, they're first time pitchers in the major leagues. You can't really expect them to pitch well. Jonathan India has been on the IL now two times with a hamstring thing. Joey Votto has been quite frankly downright awful this year he went on the COVID IL on Tuesday so not much going well for the Reds right now Miami Marlins another interesting team they had a seven game winning streak and then they come out here and they get swept by the Diamondbacks so that's that's a rough look I do have a kind of a bone to pick with Don Mattingly or whoever uh is mandating that Jazz Chisholm doesn't play le- against left-handed pitchers. and It just doesn't make sense to me. With Jazz Chisholm, who is quietly becoming a superstar in front of our eyes, he's been amazing this season. He's cut his strikeout rate considerably. This guy was a terrible, like, he had terrible numbers at, at uh, like, low A with the Diamondbacks. That was kind of the reason they traded him in the Zach Gallen deal. But... He, he's he's making it work for him right now, hitting for power, stealing bases. There's a lot to like. You you can't make that kind of a player who has this star potential into a part time player who doesn't play against lefties. You got to get him the reps. You got to get him that experience. And um, I really don't get it. Like, well, what is Miami doing? Maybe Mattingly doesn't like him, or maybe the front office is. Uh, dictating that this happens the rangers uh, got caught in the roster crunch as well they dfa'd willie calhoun who has shockingly now played in parts of six seasons with the rangers hard to believe and none of those years he's played more than 100 games health has been a major issue for him and when he's played he really has no defensive home so when that's the case, you got to hit, and that hasn't been the case. He's politely requested a trade, so he's going to go down to AAA, see if he can get some things figured out, and, and we'll see if it, another team takes a chance on him. I'm sure someone will. Josh Lowe, another top prospect, but um, he is a, he's a prospect right now, and he got sent down. Uh, funny thing about the Rays is he was batting cleanup in the days leading up to his demotion. So it's like they clearly believe in him. Otherwise, you're not going to bat this guy, you know, cleanup. But at the same time, they're the Rays. They didn't want to lose a guy like Brett Phillips, who gives them that great defense and and uh, <laughs> intangible qualities. But Josh Lowe back to the minors after he hit 188, 257, 344. Struck out 38% of the time. We knew the strikeouts would be an issue with the guy. So hopefully he'll be back soon. And I'm still bullish on on his future with the Rays. New York Yankees. Just like the Mets. I mean, this is weird. Everything seems like it's going right for the New York teams at the same time. Usually it feels like the sky is falling. And I, I questioned their plan they seem like they were weirdly built with uh, kind of light hitting guys up their middle. They kind of prioritized their defense with the additions of Isaiah Kinder Falefa, Josh Donaldson, uh, kind of going defense first catcher in Higashioka. And, you know, I got to give it to the Yankees. This is actually looking incredibly smart with the way they're rotating their infielders. So, Basically, LeMahieu, uh, Donaldson, Rizzo, and then the the big the, the big boy Stanton and Judge can rotate through that DH spot. Basically, one infielder sits out or DHs every day, and 
everyone's playing like six or five days a week and they're all staying super fresh. And this team has just been fantastic in every aspect of the game. I, I don't know what you could possibly be complaining about if you're the Yankee, if you're a Yankees fan right now, they've actually won 12 games in a row. Aaron judge is on absolute fire. He's playing like an MVP and he's actually playing in uh, Toronto. So questions about his vaccination status are answered. Anthony Rizzo leading, leading in homers. So that's kind of a pleasant surprise to this point in the season. Kind of had a couple down years these last few with a lot of uncertainty with the Cubs, whether he was going to trade it or not or extend it or what the deal was there. That uh, short porch in right field really suits the guy extremely well. And he's one of my favorite players. Love, love to see him succeeding there with the Yankees. Pitching side, uh, they've had some also surprising performances from the back end of the rotation. Jordan Montgomery has been amazing. Nestor Cortez, uh, he just came out of nowhere last year and, uh, you know, made it work. And I wasn't really necessarily buying it. And now he's been better than that this year. So he's a cool pitcher to watch in terms of uh, the way he varies his timing of his delivery on the mound. So you got to check that out. Some of the some of the weird stuff that he does in, in the windup. Uh, so speaking of the, the roster reduction and, and, and the talk about pitchers, I wanted to, to highlight kind of some of these, these multi-inning guys that have been keys to a number of teams uh, just kind of staying afloat when, when starters haven't been fully stretched out. They're just being hesitant to pitch them deeper in, into games. And, and that's something that is going to be hard to, to keep up as – the roster shrinks and as there's less pitchers available to the manager. The first guy on this uh, multi-inning reliever list is Keegan Thompson. He's pitched 20 innings uh, out of the Cubs bullpen. Pretty unheralded guy. Um, He's got a 0.89 ERA and a 0.89 whip. He's been huge for this Cubs team that, that really struggles to get Uh, depth out of their starting pitching and quite frankly it's been quite bad I think it's fourth fourth worst in the majors this year so a guy like Keegan Thompson comes in and he cleans up people's messes and he saves the bullpen for a number of days I don't know I mean the Cubs are not they're not a great team by any means but without Keegan Thompson I mean they're nine and 14 right now maybe they would have lost a couple more of those games and you're talking about a seven win team at this point in the season not great another guy kind of in a very similar role Keegan Aiken with Baltimore was a starter before the thing about these guys are they're not always uh true three time through the order um starter material but when you when you play them in a very specific situation where they can go through the lineup about once one and a half times that's a position that they can really succeed and, and their stuff plays up. They can throw harder in that shorter stint. Um, Michael King for the Yankees, he's been the most valuable reliever by wins above replacement. He's already put up 1.1 F4 in just 14 and two thirds innings. He's striking everybody out. Uh, 0.61 ERA, uh, 0.69 FIP. Uh, 13.5 Ks per nine. I mean, Michael King is unsung MVP of the Yankees right now. Um, yeah, so just some other guys. I, I'm not going to go into depth on them, but uh, Will Crow with the Pirates. Tanner Banks, he's a 30-year-old rookie with the White Sox. Been saving them a, a little bit. Brock Burke converted, uh, started to reliever. Been doing these two-inning things with Texas. Uh, yeah, so keep an eye on those guys. They, they deserve a lot of credit and they usually don't get it because kind of that, uh, long relief role used to be the worst pitcher in the bullpen. It used to be the guy that pitched when they were up by nine or losing by 10 or whatever, whatever the deal was there. But now these multi-inning guys are kind of the future of, of pitching. And it's, it's a situation where we, 
the, the cat's out of the bag. We we can't go back to the days of pitchers going eight, seven, even six innings for the most part now. Like I'd love for that to return, but I just don't see how that's possible at this the the way pitchers are uh handled. Okay, so we talked uh we revisited one trade. Uh there's kind of another trade that I want to hit on here that I find fascinating. And that's uh the Brewers and the Padres trade that they made before the 2020 season where the Brewers sent um Trent Grisham and Zach Davies to San Diego for Luis Arias and Eric Lauer. With the Brewers, uh, they were kind of they kind of looked like they were on the losing end of this trade for for a while because Grisham was really good in that first year with with San Diego, where he won the Gold Glove, uh, was a great leadoff presence for that team, and you know kind of an ascendant player. And then Davies was really good in the short season, and then he was never good after that. But uh, Urias actually was – the reason I thought of this trade is because Urias was activated from the IL. He kind of had a mini breakout last season, and um, I'd like to see what he can do. The Brewers have been ridiculous pitching-wise again, uh, but kind of in a different way. Corbin Burns – is still Corbin Burns. He's been dominant. He just, I mean, he's, it's scary how good that man is at pitching. Um, lost my train of thought there, but um, Woodruff and, and Freddie Peralta, they're still kind of figuring it out. They've had hit or miss starts to this point, but the back end of the rotation to this point Adrian Hauser and Eric Lauer are good. It's I guess I shouldn't be shocked because of how successful they've been with all their pitchers, but they're not just normal back end starters. They're they're actually like really amazing ones. And and Hauser's been doing it. They've both kind of been doing it since midway through last year. So Hauser, uh, he's got a 253 RA and 21 in the third innings. Lauer's got 34 strikeouts in 23 in the third innings. I mean, that's some Corbin Burns stuff right there. 193 ERA. If we were voting on the Cy Young, people would probably be voting for Eric Lauer. I was watching a Hauser start over the weekend against the Cubs, and he blows one by a hitter at 97. I was like, what? When did Adrian Hauser start throwing 97? Um, So, I mean, they've got a great rotation, and they've got the same questions about their pitching staff, or sorry, their lineup, which has been okay at best. Christian Yelich has shown some flashes of being the old Yelich, but I don't think we're getting the full rebound that Brewers fans would like. That trade, though, where they got Lauer and Urias, it's looking quite a bit better for the Brewers now if Lauer is actually this guy and. I kind of think he he he's really good. He's a really good pitcher. Uh, switching to the Padres, Eric Hosmer, uh, big surprise, I guess. Maybe uh, he's. I, I I'm gonna be honest. Like he hit 390 in the in the month of April. This is one of those just things that can happen when you're a extreme ground ball hitter, and that has not changed at all. He's still hitting tons of ground balls. The rate around 60%, but they just all happen to be finding holes. I mean, Hosmer, he's running some ridiculous BABIP at this point, but I do not expect it to to, uh, continue like this, even though we've been tempted before and uh, we know how it usually turns out. C.J. Abrams is still on the roster, and I don't really understand why because – He's not even playing much. He's started, I think, five out of the last 15 games, which doesn't really make sense to do with your top prospect who's barely played in the first place because of so many injuries as he was progressing through the minors. 
you you wonder what the what the plan is for CJ Abrams long term because he's a very high ceiling prospect, but the Padres don't feel comfortable playing him on an everyday basis at this point in the year. Manny Machado is uh, one of the leading candidates for MVP along with Hosmer at this point in the year. So we talked a lot. I talked a lot. Um, this was a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone's support. And um, if you can give us a, a rating and review on Apple, Spotify, uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, we will uh, talk to you soon in two weeks. A uh, reminder that uh, we are off next week for our baseball trip, which will we will keep you posted. Uh, hit us up on social media, Facebook and Twitter, at Getaway Day Pod. Uh, my name is uh, Gautam, and I will talk to you next time.